Storytelling is really part of how we make sense of the world and ourselves as humans, right? Neuroscience shows the two types of thinking. There's a logical one, a narrative-based one, and we learn much better with a narrative-based one. This superpower can really help you make sense of your career, make sense of your working identity, and also hopefully making you future-proof when AI is taking the world. From the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Hey, Ricardo. How are you doing? And I know you're in one of my favorite places in the world. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Pedro. Yes, I'm in Berlin, which today it's surprisingly sunny, which reminds me of home. It always warms my heart. Oh, <laughs> nice. And where is home for you? Because we were talking a little bit about this just before we started. So just to make me even more jealous. Well, oh yeah, that's where is home? That's always a tough question, right? I think there is multiple homes. It's off here and off in Portugal. Portugal. Oh, I've been to Lisbon, but I was only there for 24 hours, so I do need to go back. Is there anywhere near Lisbon that you're from originally, or what, what's the place? No, I'm from the very unexpected place that people don't know about Portugal. It's between Porto and Lisbon, but next to Spain, from the highest mountains in Portugal, which is the only place in Portugal you can ski and snowboard. I don't surf, I'm afraid of water, but I ski since I'm six years old. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. My daughter, she's at high school and she recently went on a skiing trip to Canada and it's the first time she's ever skied and she came back just buzzing with excitement and joy and I wish I could ski but I, I definitely can't so I always admire anyone that can do those adventurous sports. I, I guess Berlin doesn't have mountains so you can't really do much there. No, it's pretty flat. You can do a lot of, what do they call it? You can do a lot of cardio if you go clubbing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. For the unadventurous like me, that's for me then. All right. Awesome. And Ricardo, which superpower would you like to bring to this particular episode? I would like to bring the superpower of storytelling. And now this superpower can really help you make sense of your career, make sense of your working identity, and also hopefully making you future proof when AI is taking the world, that's probably one of the things that they are still sucking is that telling stories and making sense of the world. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Because when I think of storytelling, I often think about when you're presenting to a crowd of people and you're using stories to articulate a message or to get things to stick in people's minds. I've never thought about it in this other context about how it can help you in your career and how you can get your voice out there in the world. So I'm really intrigued to know more about this. But before that, I'd love to know a little bit more about your background. And if you could take me right back to your childhood and you can start at whatever year you like, but what was a young Ricardo like as a young boy? And how did you end up getting into this specialism that you're in now? Ah, Nobody asked me that question so far, except apart from my therapist for a long time ago. <laughs> no, I love it. I, yeah, I was a bit rebellious. I was also the only child of the family. I was the first child, the first grandchild, the first. So I was the, the king of my own kingdom for a very long time, as you can imagine. So I was a bit rebellious, but I was always very connected with art as well. Like I loved cartoons. I loved comics. So I always, I loved stories. I think it also started right there. I grew up also between three kitchens, either the kitchen of my mom, the kitchen of my two grand, two, my two grandmothers. Uh, so there is, as you can know, there is a lot of storytelling going in the kitchen. That's uh, the environment I grew up. And also my grandparents used to have a, a car business in a small hotel. So I always grew up with people working and living all at the same time, which always made me that I don't want to have my own business, which is surprising many years later. And then 
yeah, what did I do? Typical things, all kinds of music, all kinds of gothic, punk, uh, hip hop uh, phases that needed, made my parents not that very proud. <laughs> and then I went to university with an excuse that I don't want to study super hard. They told me that I should have been an engineer. They were really totally wrong. I went to fine arts. I had a blast. I was not the greatest artist, but I was good at telling stories and I was good at illustration, which to be honest, didn't pay the bills. But I tried to be a horror movie director with a passion of telling stories, but it didn't pay the bills either. And then I went to branding and advertisement and all of that. And it was good. Crisis hit in Portugal. I decided, well, I'm moving to Berlin, quit my job, thousand bucks in the pocket and a sofa, no job. And I started from scratch again. So I was working already as a designer for a long time. And then I pivoted completely to UX design, being an intern in a very scrappy startup and I moved my way through and that prolonged to a career of 11 years. And in the last three years of that career, I was starting to be fairly disappointed with the world of tech, which maybe there's something we can talk about that later, and which culminated in um, burnout. And during this burnout of eight months out of work, I really realized that I lived my career in autopilot mode, but in the sense of driven by financial anxiety, driven by getting stability, but was never very intentional. So that came to a halt, made me rethink all the steps and what came next. And I was total blank. And that blank was really scary. And during this process of experimenting new things and, and, and trial and error, I discovered that maybe coaching was something I would love to do because throughout my life, I had been doing something similar, not as a coach, but elements of coaching. And in the end, was very messy, but made total sense. So Ricardo, I almost have like a mirror right now of when you were talking that through, it feels like I was looking at myself, although you have a lot more hair than I do. But in terms of your background, so I'm an only child and as a kid growing up, I really loved art and comics as well, hence the superpowers theme. And I wanted to do art, but again, my parents were like, it's not going to pay the bills and get yourself a proper job. And I went into tech as well. So very mm. similar backgrounds, which is super, super interesting. And what I always find, because I ask this question to almost every guest, and it's always amazing how we start here and then we end up like in this other place in terms of our career. And it's very rare that you are in the place that you wanted to be as a child. I, I think there's probably only one or two people I know that ended up doing that. And that's my good friend who's a doctor. And from day one, he said, I'm going to be a doctor. And he is a doctor now. And that, that's like his life. <laughs> but very rare that happens, right? Why do you think that is? Like a, a lot of us end up doing all these other things and... It's just amazing, this whole journey of life, how it ends up. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think there is many different reasons for that. I think there is even cultural and geographic reasons. I can talk about, from my perspective, in Portugal, it's not that I could afford to be very intentional about my career, right? Especially, was there was not so many opportunities at that point. So it's not that, oh, I want to go to this type of agency or this type of company. It's just like, well, if I work in something related even to my area, I can already consider myself lucky, right? So, and then, so, I don't know, accidentally you enter this path and you start creating your own path and maybe you go more autopilot, maybe you get more intentional, but I think it all starts with the first step. And some people are really tenacious about, no. This is the first step and I'm going to make it happen no matter what. I think there is, I'm not sure how you feel about this because I think this idea that, oh, I want to be this and I become dead. I think in partly many people derive that sentiment and they are true and, and authentic. But I think maybe a lot of us have this mode of operandi and thinking because that's what you have been growing up. What do you want to go when you are a big boy? When you are an adult, what's your dream job? And there you are with five years old. I don't know. Firefighter, <laughs> how is it for you? I don't know. How do you see this? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think my first job that I said I wanted to be was an electrician. And then I found out you had to be really good at maths and physics. And I was no good at either of those. So that went out the window very quickly. So then it went on to other things. But 
I, I think aside from the the difficulty factor, it, it is often the case of you just are put under pressure and you get told this is a good thing for you to do. But I, I really believe in conversation steering our path. And it's like when, when I'm out and about, I now talk to anyone, right? If I'm out and about, and I'm the, probably the most annoying person to take on holiday because <laughs> if someone goes, hey, go and get a drink, I'll probably be at the bar for about half an hour, right? Just because I'm talking to everybody around me. And I just have this habit now that I, I say I'm addicted to conversation. Whereas I, I used to be a professional introvert. Like that was how I grew up. I was very quiet, timid, and now I've gone the complete opposite. But what I believe is every conversation can nudge you slightly in different directions. And I love that because who knows, like from our conversation, something might come out of that and I go, oh, that's something I had no idea about. And now I'm going to go into that direction. And then I think these conversations end up steering us in so many ways. And how often do you hear like someone say, this was a turning point in my life because I bumped into this one person and they changed my life completely because of the conversation that we had, right? And, and so that's what I believe, which brings me on to the storytelling, because it's often through other people's stories that we get inspired to take action. So tell me more about the storytelling angle that you were talking about at the start of the episode. I love this conversation point about it because it's also part of something that it's about networks and I want to put a pin point on this, pin on this. The storytelling angle came because throughout my career, I had to reinvent myself quite sometimes. And with reinventing yourself comes to a question of identity. And when if it's connected to work, it also comes with a question of value to others. So making sense of what you are and what you can offer and make it valuable to others to hire you, to trust you, to get the client in, you, you really need to practice this, right? So it's like a bit of a parenthesis here. I study fine arts, but I was a crappy artist. So the only good thing I was good at is like drawing, photography, and video, but like anything that was painting and sculpture, I was really bad. The art field has this component, well, well, if I justify it well enough, I can justify a crappy work into a beautiful piece of art. So I, <laughs> I started to develop that muscle then a little bit, but it is a way of showing value. So when I moved to Berlin, for example, and I went to digital, nobody wanted to hire me for two reasons. You don't come from the digital background. And second, you do too many things. And in Germany, contrary to Portugal, it's very different because Portugal is, you are a jack of all trades, a MacIver, Swiss Army knife, great. We pay you one salary, you do three jobs and you are happy about it. In Germany, it's like, no, you do your own thing, you do it well, and you be paid to very fairly. So it was a culture clash. So adapting my story to that, like, okay, I cannot sell myself in all of this. I need to, for this company or for this, for these people, I need to sell me like this. And I need to sell me like that for these ones. But this is not lying or anything. It's just tailor your story and tailor your value to whoever is listening to. And that my own experience allowed me to really reinvent myself at each and every step of my career journey. And that's what I bring also to my work nowadays. That's a really interesting point about the German culture, about doing that job really well, because as we were talking just before we kicked off, I worked for a big German investment bank and I can absolutely see it because that was very much the culture there as well. It was like, this is your title. So why are you meddling with this other stuff? And I was like, ah, cause it's interesting. I like that stuff. And they're like, no, you should be sticking to this. This is your remit. And, and that was very interesting in terms of the culture. And so with storytelling, then, if we're going to explore how this can help the average person on the street, like, tell me more about that. First of all, why should people care about storytelling? And secondly, as a tech professional, how can it help me? So storytelling is really part of how we make sense of the world and ourselves as humans, right? Neuroscience shows the two types of thinking. There's a logical one, a narrative-based one, and we learn much better with a narrative-based one. We suck at remember facts, but we are very good at remembering facts if they are attached to a story and if there is a background to it and so on. And there is a lot of neuroscience that shows that our brains are much better wired for stories. So on one level, there is this biological component. 
On another level, like on evolutionary level, we also, in the first type of storytelling was literally gossip. If you were in your own tribe, if you, people were not talking good about you, you probably will die because you'll be outcast from the tribe and it being eaten by a lion. And I'm, I'm just going back because a lot of our societies and civilizations are story-based. Religions are story-based. There are facts, but there's a culture of stories passed on and passed on to generation that creates belief systems and so on. It's not as different as us, as individuals. We start creating these stories about ourselves when we are a child. We kept creating stories and these stories justify identities and make sense of the world around us. Now, how many times do we actually reflect on the stories that we are telling ourselves and what are that stories telling about ourselves? So when we realize that we make sense of the world with storytelling, it becomes really important to understand what is the story I'm telling about myself, first for me and then for the others. Because those stories might limit your self-esteem. That self-esteem might limit, mm, maybe I don't apply to this job, I'm not that good or not enough. And then starts limiting your, your options in life. And then those options start to limit your life and then cycles back to the identity, oh, I'm this and I'm that. And it's a, a loop. So the idea is if you can expand your field of vision through your own story and understand that your story is much bigger, much broader, you can make better sense of the world and of yourself both as a person and as a tech profession in this case. And so if I was to apply this to my own life and my own self, how might I do that? So would I think about some of my childhood challenges that I've overcome and build up almost a bank of stories and then relate that to perhaps a modern day challenge that I've got. How do you then bring that storytelling to practice and to be able to then practically use it in your day to day? So I don't go that deep on the childhood path because I think that we are crossing a bit territory on, on, on psychology and, and therapy. Although the more knowledge you have about yourself on that and how does that shape your personality, it's great, right? Because it does feed into how you relate to work. I go a little bit on a, not the, in a higher level in that sense, where we start, for example, mapping out different things. So let me put it this way. There is, how do you see yourself? So your identity piece. And there is what actually happened in your life. And the identity piece, you're going to like this because there is an exercise that I created. I'm not the superhero kind of person, but, but I love comics and there is always some superhero kind of things. So there is this exercise where I uh, uh, let people to draw their own superhero based on the superpowers they have, because it's always easier to start talking on the third person, right? It's just, I, my superhero has fast boots because I, I work really fast and has a cape because I can jump from project to project and stuff like that. So putting yourself in the third person already helps to create distance and to make it playful, mm -hmm. right? The second point is making really an, a retrospective of everything you did. Even the summer jobs where you were working at a cafe, you were already learning about customer service centric support and learning about people, right? Or maybe just managing a cashier. That's already a lot. Every single work experience that you had. And what was the value that you brought to the table? What skills did you develop? And what stories shaped you, right? So in one hand, it feels like, well, that doesn't sound very much storytelling. You are just collecting facts. Yes, we need to collect a lot of facts. So, for example, we also collect the facts. Okay, I had this official title, but in reality, I've been doing three different jobs in this, but I never talk about them. So I encourage people, talk about those jobs. That as a name. What was the impact of you doing that unofficial title had in this job? You start mapping all the facets of every project, of everything, and then you start looking, oh, I did all of these. Ah, but I always took this as granted. This is... It's just a thing I do. So you start making a lot more sense because there you go, start opening up a lot more the field of vision. And when you have all of this big library, you and all laid out, it brings a lot of clarity of the things you actually achieved, the things you did, and a lot of times shows red threads. And that's when you can start making sense of your narrative and creating different ones. I'm actually 
thinking back and reflecting on when I was growing up and I had my first ever weekend job and I mentioned I was very much an introvert. I wouldn't really talk to people. I didn't have the confidence to be able to walk up to a complete stranger and just strike a conversation. And I remember my mum, we were walking through town and she spotted a sign in the window and they were asking for Saturday staff. And she literally grabbed me and shoved me in the shop and said, go ask them for a job. And so I was forced to ask the manager for a job. And a uh, long story short, I got the job and it was on the checkout. But that was like my first real flavor of a, a customer service type of environment and actually speaking to strangers and getting to be a little bit uncomfortable in, in my social skills. And it really unlocked a lot for me. And I think that was that first stepping stone. And then beyond that, it was those weekend and holiday jobs, I think, that really started to bring me out of my shell a little bit. So I really like that activity you mentioned because those moments are pivotal, right, into how we end up becoming and it's these small nudges slowly that change us into the people that we are today and hopefully for the better. But yeah, I'm just trying to think like, what would be your superpower as an individual then? Me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's always hard to eat our own dog food, right? <laughs> one thing that I've been reflecting, it didn't help me. So one of the exercises that I did for myself and I also keep doing with people is these successes versus happiness. Right, A lot of our successes is not what makes us happy. And a lot of what makes us happy doesn't pay the bills or makes you very successful. And you're going to like this one because I know, Paddy, you have your visual thinking meetup, right? You are you like visual thinking. Yeah. And I like this. When I was in consulting and also in-house, I was doing a lot of presentations for C-level and decision makers. And I often had to show very complex uh, problems that were happening in organizations so in very simple ways. They have little time. So... I make use of my arts degree and I like to do illustrations and diagrams that shows really quick that. And I realized that I cannot make a living out of that for myself. But I was wondering, what is behind this that I like to do that it still shows in other places? Coaching. Why? Because I came to realize that what I like to do is to digest complex, abstract thoughts or concepts into digestible bits, outputs that people can take action on. And coaching is that. I don't do diagrams. I don't design stuff, but I help people to deconstruct their thinking, uh, making it tangible, making, making sense of this abstract mess that we have in our heads and gaining clarity. And I get exactly the same kicks out of that as out of, at the end of the day, oh, look at this nice graphic. Isn't it nice? You can get the thing in five seconds. So it's, it also bleeds a bit into what kind of transferable skills one can create for ourselves. I was going to ask you about if you could give us an example of a client without obviously revealing any personal details where somebody has worked with you and they followed some of these techniques. Like what was the impact and how were you able to help them? Yeah. So there is a recent one, actually, that I've been working on. And this person is quite advanced in, in their career. And there is always a bit this hesitation of to become a people manager or not. Oh, I don't have that much experience and so on. Fair enough. We were trying to position this person in different types of fields and creating the different positionings for himself. But this people's management was always in the background. And as we were doing this retrospective of the career, we were like, ah, and here I, I had a team, but I was not their manager, but I was taking care of their problems and I was like growing them and mentoring them. Like, ah, and in this job, I was out doing the same, but a little bit harder because I needed to also control and also, you know, make sure that their career was growing and creating career plans. And then I had to say, sorry, it sounds like I've been doing people management for many years, but nobody told you. Like, what? No, but that was never in my contract. It was never in my role. Well, but look at what you just wrote. Okay. Wow. And then a whole set of opportunities opened because then we stopped not only looking for IC roles, like individual contributors. This person now is like, 
I can actually do this. And I've been doing it, right? Even if they didn't add the title or the official responsibility. So that's the impact that it can have when you realize and make this retrospective that you have been doing a lot of things that you think you don't have the power, you think you don't have the skills and actually vibe. Oh, wait a sec. I do have this. If you then are reflecting on your past, like how do you know what stories are relevant and what aren't? Because I struggle to remember what I did yesterday. And then if I'm delving back into history, I guess I would have to be looking for specific things. So are there prompts that you give to your clients for them then to search in the right areas of that long-term memory? Yeah, I think it's a phased process in the end. It's not intentional, but I think there is a phased process. So for example, we start mapping out superpowers, right? They come with their superhero design. This is what I did and this is what I like and this is what I'm strong at. So that already sets them a bit the context of the bigger self that goes a little bit beyond these professional skills. Then we do reflections about successes versus happiness, right? Because it's a more emotional process, that part successes versus happiness, you often tend to have a lot of information that you just comes out because for the good and for the bad, we memorize these emotions. And when it comes to then to the career timeline, when you digest really deep, you are already in a state that you already opened the gates in a sense. And what happens in this process is people say often to me, well, I totally forgot about that, but as I was starting to dig in and then I started to remember, ah, and that happened. So it's a process that the more you dig deeper, the more it, it, it surfaces. I always receive the same comment. This is really good, but it's extremely painful to do. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it is because it's, especially if you are mid-career or quite advanced, it's a lot to take stock of, but it comes out. Yeah. It comes out. There's a really famous thought leader influencer, Vin. He does the like public speaking content. Mm. There's a huge amount he does out there. And I remember he was on a podcast once and he said, I always carry a notepad and pen wherever I am because it's my bank of stories. And whenever something happens in his life, he wants to immediately capture it and then what he does is he stores all these up and then A, it helps him remember them. But then secondly, when he's sharing lessons learned or he's on podcasts and speaking to other people, he can go through his bank and go, ah, here's some relevant stuff. And he can dig that out. And I wish I had done that like from day one, because if I look back and I think now, oh, like there is so much that we experience that. At the time, we don't realize it. Like, for example, when we do a project and it fails, the time it's very frustrating and we think it's bad news, but actually it's such gold in terms of material for the future to tell your children, to tell your teams, to tell other people just the amazing things you learned from that experience. I'd love to hear your advice on that. Oh, the, I, I love that one because... It's something that, well, I struggle with it myself, right? If I had a bad experience and I had some in my life and at work and in certain jobs, I don't store them very fondly, right? So I might tend to even push them away, put it under the carpet and not even have the, the distance to understand that I'm sitting in a pile of gold that I'm not telling. So I had to do this exercise for myself, looking back and realize, wait a second, yeah, it sucks. This was a terrible project. I suffered a lot. It was terrible. But actually the output of work that I did, it's still valuable. And what I learned, it is actually a great story, which helped me to make peace with it. And this is what happens with people when they go through their career timelines and analyzing them. It's just that, oh, actually I'm looking at that project in a completely different way. Yes, my boss was a completely mm, word I cannot say, but... <laughs> Actually, it was a good project in the end of the day. And why am I not telling this story? But one needs to make peace with this. So this is also a bit of a cathartic experience to analyze your own story because you is making peace with the past in the end. Yeah. And like last week I was up in Glasgow, up in Scotland, mm -hmm. and I was delivering some training. And it's not often I get to do training now because... In my day job, I look after, you'd say, strategy stuff. And, and I really miss the day-to-day -day training side of things. 
but I got the rare opportunity to actually teach. And it was great because the cohort that I had, yes, they wanted to learn. They wanted to learn about the principles and the techniques and all of that good stuff. But every other question from them was, can you tell us when you've used that? Or can you tell us when to use that? And those sort of questions I find come up often in training sessions because people want to know your war stories. They want to know your experiences of that thing. And this is where it'll be actually quite interesting for us to delve into AI a little bit, because there's obviously a lot of uncertainty about jobs in the future and how AI is going to revolutionize and change things. But AI cannot tell your story. It can tell you based on all the data that's been fed into it. And I think this skill that you talked about on this episode, rant or sort of personal storytelling is invaluable and, and so valuable because AI hopefully can't replicate it, I'm guessing, right? So I think we're good for a while. Totally. One can see the shows and the scripts that are coming out of AI, they're pretty bad. <laughs> but it's true. I think because it's AI cannot make sense of the world and cannot make sense of identity. No, at least. And this is also partly what makes us humans. There is no other animal that tells stories, not that we know, not that makes sense of the world with stories and metaphors and, and symbols. So it's an inherently human skill. But one of the things that is a bit frustrating nowadays, I'm not sure how you see this, is that people focus a lot on hard skills, right? on learning the tools and especially, I come from design, it's especially prevalent in design to like knowing the latest Figma plugin or the latest language. And it's just when this is become so obsolete so quickly and storytelling and making sense of the world, it's something that we're gonna take to our grave to make sense of the world, to make sense of ourselves. So I do believe Storytelling is also great because we need to reinvent ourselves often. AI is coming for our jobs or the world is changing. I'm not even 40s and I had different jobs. And I see, and most likely my job is going to be very different in five years. It's changing it at a ridiculous fast pace. So the better we get at telling our own story and making sense of the world, the faster we reinvent ourselves. But yeah, I don't know how you see this. I'm also curious to see your point. Yeah, no, 100%. I... I'm totally with you. And it reminded me of when I was a child and we used to go to India a lot. And my parents used to literally go every year. And I remember the one year I spent six months in India as a child. And they got a little bit worried with me because I never used to play with the other children. I would much rather sit under the trees and the shade listening to the village elders because all the guys would get together and these are like my granddad's age and his friends, right? So they're yeah. pretty old and they'd be playing cards, but they'd be sharing all these amazing stories. And I would just sit there. I'm talking about the age of six or seven, right? This is super young. Whereas all the normal kids will be out there playing marbles and you know, running around in the fields and just having a great time. And I'd just be sat there listening with uh, patience. And I'd look back on that now and I reflect on that. And I think just even those stories, like no one's ever captured those. There's no tech to capture those stories and uh, no AI is ever going to know those stories. And that was all based on the moment and the feeling and the experience that I as an individual was having. And then I've carried those forward. And so, yeah, I totally agree. I think there's huge value in the stories that we have. And this is the other thing I really believe in is like, I'm getting a bit deep now, probably too deep, but, and philosophic. Go ahead. Right. It's a, like, we're all in this race to make more money, get promoted, get more money in the bank, get more money in the bank. And as they say, your bank balance is going to be left, right? Eventually. And when we leave the earth and all the rest of it, it's just going to sit in a bank, but it's the memories that hopefully people will remember. And that's, I think, the things that define us as individuals. So I always say, like, make as many memories as you can, right? At every moment, whenever we're out and about, whenever we're even at work, like, if we can create memories, create those moments, they're the things A, people are going to remember you by, but secondly, they're the things that are going to stay with you. And that's one of the reasons why I love 
the podcast. I love talking to really interesting people, really diverse thoughts and cultures, because otherwise, where would I get that? Like I could sit here on my laptop and read someone else's article, but I'm not getting that same flavor. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. And I think one of the outcomes that I didn't saw coming, as you see coming to as this transition to coaching was I like this one-on-one -on -one interaction, right? I like to be fully with somebody and really enjoy this moment, but I didn't know how much I enjoyed it until I became a coach and how much the people that I've worked with, they might not understand how much they teach me and how much I learn from these moments and how much I also soak their wisdom and soak their experience and get so exposed to so many different lifestyles, different ways of thinking, different ways of seeing life. It's quite inspiring. That's something that I did never saw it coming. And it's, I'm so happy that I have that on my day today. So I totally relate with what you say. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> And as we fast approach time, I'm going to ask you one of my favorite questions I love to ask every guest, which is, if I could give you any superpower to abolish something in the world of work for 24 hours, what would that be? I know. On a very serious note, I want to say trauma, but on a very unserious note, but also serious is, can we just be honest about what we are doing and about the value of the things that we are doing and just be fine with it? <laughs> It's just, I think that was always the, the thing that pushed my buttons. Like, we all know that we, we are not saving children here. We are not revolutionizing the world. We are making, like, small product that marginally improves the life of somebody. It's exciting for everyone, but it's not the greatest thing in our lives, right? It's not the be-all and end-all that even justifies the most obnoxious behavior. So if we were honest about, it's fun. It's a job. We're doing cool stuff. Yeah, we're improving some lives, but that's it. That's it. it. So I think being honest and taking out all of this glossiness and just be also okay with it because it's also fine. That would be very refreshing. I try that in my life. It does not make you a lot of friends. <laughs> that actually reminds me. I remember working on like systems and it's just exactly that scenario. The fact that we are introducing this new tech product means people won't need to do manual spreadsheets Right. And, but if we fail, like you're going to be in big trouble and the whole team are going to be in big trouble. So we're all sweating and going, oh my God, we've got to deliver this thing. And then you look at it from that perspective and it's like, yeah, what's the big deal? It just means a few salespeople won't have long coffee breaks anymore. Like that, what's the big deal? And so <laughs> that's the impact. Well, fine. Let's not kill ourselves. But yeah, I love that. Great one. Great one. What would be yours? Can I ask the same question? Oh, okay. Well, I normally say my kind of funny one, but I, I think I need a proper one. So mine was like banning pineapple pizza because I don't get that concept. But I think if I had to really come up with a serious one, embracing difference, like stop hiding who you are at work, right? And really embrace your differences. So I, for many years, had hidden my culture, like, and who I was, because I felt that in the corporate world, no one wants to know that. No one wants to know my background. They don't want to know about my culture. So I was trying to always fit in and I didn't really embrace my difference. But now I've come to the realization that being different is actually a superpower, right? And the fact that you're from a different culture, it's really intriguing for people when people like to know these little nuggets that you can then give them because it's something different. And, and so, yeah, that's what I would probably say is embrace who you are and bring it to work and let the world know. Well, I loved it. That's great. Also because I love pineapple pizza. Sorry for the, for the disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this is where we fall out. Oh no, Ricardo. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Yeah, I can easily take them off. I should scrape the pineapple off. Like, it's no big deal, right? It's just me being <laughs> Fair <bad>. enough. <laughs> okay, and the other final question is, resources have inspired you in terms of this superpower. So if people want to know more and they want to find out at a deeper level on some of these topics, what sort of resources would you recommend? So I think one of the resources that I recommend is, uh, I have the book here, actually, with me. It's called Working Identity. 
It's from Yermini Ibarra, and she makes a lot of research about career transitions and what makes uh, a successful career transition and how identity is merged into that. I'm terrible at names. I think uh, the, the Storytelling Animal is a great book to understand how stories uh, also related to, to the humans. Sorry, I'm, I forgot the, the author. Uh, apologies for that, but the Storytelling Animal is another one. But I think for me, storytelling is where can you get inspired for stories, right? Like you under the tree, listening to the grandparents' stories and the books you read, the movies, and try to understand what's behind them and oh, what do you like in them. That's also something that, that really helps me a lot. And I think people can lean on this. Look at your favorite authors. Why do you like them? That's also something that really inspires me a lot. It's just like, why do I like this type of author? And why do I like the way they talk? That's some resources I can share. I can also share my kit if you are interested. So I have this career storytelling kit, which is for free. And it comes with a webinar. <clears throat> so you understand what's behind this and how can you use it? So maybe I'll pass you the link later on. And... Yeah, I think for now, that's what comes to my mind in terms of resources. Oh, brilliant. And uh, yes, we'll include the link in the show notes. So please, folks, do get in touch with Ricardo. I'll also put his contact details as well, so you can get in touch with him directly. And that book, The Storytelling Animal, I was Googling it in the background. It's by Jonathan Gottschall, I think is how you yeah. say the name. There we yeah. go. So that's another great book. Thank you so much for that. Well, Ricardo, it's been a pleasure. I've Really enjoyed this conversation. We've shared a few stories and I love what you're doing. And yeah, I love the fact that you're really helping people to change their lives and it is life changing. So we sometimes get stuck in a rut when it comes to our careers and for you to be then that person to help unlock some of that friction for people is amazing. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I didn't realize it has almost been an hour and we just surfed right through it. It's been really a pleasure to be here, Paddy. Thank you so much. And good luck with this fantastic podcast. I think you are on a very good mission to make us all future-proof. It's very much needed. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, my friend. It's the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please do connect with me via LinkedIn and drop me a message and let me know your favorite takeaways from the episode. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Superpower School newsletter so that you can be notified of all future episodes. Simply visit the website www.superpowers.school. Thank you once again.